insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Credits rolled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode one of No Credits Rolled. My name is Sam Whalen. I'm going to be your host today. And you know what? Maybe this is a pilot episode. Maybe it's the real first episode. Who's to say, really? Maybe I'm just feeling things out. Never hosted a podcast solo before. So we're going to see just how long I can talk to myself and to you, dear listener. Uh, but what we do here in No Credits Rolled is we talk about the games we play, but we almost never finish. And we talk about some gaming news along the way. Uh, today we're not going to do it in that order. We're going to cover the news first, and then we're going to get to the games. Um, and with it being our first episode, I thought we'd cover something topical. Now, I don't I have no idea when this episode's going to air, where it's going to air, or uh, you know who's going to hear it. But I just got, uh, decided we're going to talk about the Game Awards today, because uh, it's something that I am interested in. And it's something that I already had show notes written for, for a different podcast I was on. So, you know, less work for me. Um, so let's just talk about the Game Awards, the Game of the Year nominations, all, well, not all the categories, some of the categories that I would like to cover. Uh, as of the recording, the Game Awards are tonight. Papa Jeff will grace us with some announcements. He'll grace us with some awards and uh, probably an all-around great time. But we're here to talk about the nominations, folks, okay? So we'll start with the big one, I guess. We'll start with Game of the Year. It's the headliner. And we've got our nominations. First up, we've got Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Of course, this is from Nintendo. Um, I'll be honest, I did not like uh, Breath of the Wild. I was not a Breath of the Wild fan. Never finished it. Um, kind of just played it out of obligation, right? Because if, you know, if you're a gamer, if you want to use that word... And I don't, but I do. Um, Zelda was one of those, Breath of the Wild specifically, was one of those games where it's like, okay, everybody needs to play this. Uh, and I did. I did play it. But it never really clicked with me. Um, I found it the lack of a map and the lack of real direction to be, um, it was just tough for me to keep playing it. And I know that that's what some people liked about it, right? They liked that go anywhere, do anything, explore the game how you wanted to. But when I, you know, I'm, what, two hours in and I'm looking up guides for how to do everything. It was just, you know, it wasn't for me. Um, that being said, Tears of the Kingdom, I actually really enjoyed. Um, I still haven't finished it because, you know, no credits are old. We're never going to finish these games, baby. All right, that's my thing. But I enjoyed it a lot more, uh, and I am enjoying it a lot more than Breath of the Wild. I think the biggest thing for me with Tears of the Kingdom is the uh, toolkit you have, right? The the abilities you've got you've, with the, um, the phase thingy and the fuse and the... Uh, so the telekinesis is the best one, in my opinion. The, the ability to pick stuff up. I think it's called Ultra Hand in the game. Sorry, I'll use Zelda fans out there. Um, it's it's really telekinesis, if you think about it. But uh, I think that, that toolkit is much more appealing to me than the toolkit you're given in Breath of the Wild. I think you could do a lot more with it. So I, I really think that's what makes the game more fun for me. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm almost done. I think I'm on the final boss fight. But I, for the life of me, cannot get that parry mechanic down. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, I'll get to it eventually. It's like playing a Souls game for me. And I know it's like, it's Zelda. It's not supposed to be that hard. But it is when you suck at the parry mechanic and the combat in that game. Because uh, I still don't like the combat, even from Breath of the Wild going into Tears of the Kingdom. It's basically the same. And it's still not the best. Um, but hey, you know, maybe I'll finish it. Maybe I won't. And if I finish it, maybe I'll talk about it here. Because... This is no credits rolled, so do I immediately break the naming convention of this podcast and talk about something I rolled credits on? Stay tuned to find out. Next up, we got Marvel Spider-Man 2. This is coming from Insomniac. Uh, I really enjoyed Marvel Spider-Man 1. This is kind of the opposite of the Breath of the Wild to Tears of the Kingdom situation for me. Spider-Man 1, the 2018 one, I loved. That's one of like my favorite games of all time. Um, I think that the way they show Spider-Man in that game... Oh, also, full disclosure, 
Uh, Spider-Man, probably one of my top three favorite fictional characters of all time. Uh, so I am biased. That being said, I think 2018 Spider-Man did a fantastic job capturing that character. Uh, I think, you know, pulling in so many different elements, right, that we know of Spider-Man from, from comics, from movies, from TV shows, and kind of, and but also doing their own thing, making it unique, right, making their the Insomniac Spider-Man its own Spider-Man. I think it was awesome, honestly. Uh, and Spider-Man 2 is more of Spider-Man, right? If you like that gameplay, you like that, uh, you like that character, you're going to get more of that. Marvel Spider-Man 2 is more of the same, uh, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I love the gameplay. They added uh, more traversal mechanics to make it even more fun to zip around the city. You still feel like Spider-Man. My only complaints with this game come with the story and with the pacing of the story. Um, if you've seen any trailers for this game, you know we're doing we're doing Venom, folks, okay? And when you're doing Venom, if you're a Spider-Man fan and you've done Venom, you've seen Venom before... We're not straying too far from the the pretty much the same story we always do when Venom shows up, the origin of Venom. Uh, there's one slight difference, but again, if you've played the first game and you've played the post credit scene of the first game and you know, you've seen the trailer, you, I don't want to spoil it, and, you know, it's been, what, came out on October the 20th, so it's been almost two months now. Um, I'm not going to spoil it, but you can guess where the story's going. And so far, there haven't been any surprises. Um... I'm almost to the end of this game as well. Uh, at the time of recording, I was actually on the final boss fight last night when I was rudely interrupted to game with my friends. Yeah, I was at the final boss fight. Uh, we were... I was, f you know, fighting Venom. Okay, I feel like that's not a spoiler. You know this game's going to end with a Venom fight. And maybe there's more. That'd be pretty cool. Um, I'll be honest. This is an aside real quick. This is not where I thought this story was going. I thought they were going to do a similar uh, story from... Because Craven is also a bad guy from the trailers you've probably seen. I thought they were going to do from Spider-Man... Oh, uh, let me look it up. Hang on. Yes, from Spider-Man Life Story, the Chip Zdarsky book, which I highly, highly recommend you read if you're a Spider-Man fan. Uh, basically, the concept of that book is that every decade, Spider-Man ages in real time... So it starts in, like, the 50s or the 60s when, like, the original comic started. And then you do every 10 years, more happens. And what they do in that with Craven and Venom specifically, I thought was great. Because you get you get the elements of Craven's Last Hunt from the comics. And you get the Eddie Brock uh, Venom rejection angle kind of all rolled into one. And I thought they were going to do that in Spider-Man 2 to kind of, because, you know, not everybody's read that comic, but everybody knows who Venom is, if you're a Spider-Man fan, mostly. Uh, they didn't do that, spoilers. <laughs> Craven uh, meets an abrupt and, uh, for him, satisfying end. Uh, but yeah, the my biggest issues with Spider-Man 2, and why I, having not finished it, having not finished it, I would put Spider-Man 1 above Spider-Man 2 currently. And that just comes down to the pacing of the story, right? I mean, you go from... You do have two protagonists, so you're splitting your time between Peter and Miles, and maybe that's part of where that issue comes in, that issue of pacing. But I, I feel like the story escalates and de-escalates way too quickly in either direction. I don't really think there's enough time for things to breathe. And, and you know, you run into this problem when you have an open-world game that is also narrative-driven. It, there was similar things with it in God of War Ragnarok, but I think Ragnarok handled it much better, where you want to make sure you do all the side quests. You want to make sure you, you know, check off every box. And for me, when I play those games, and when they're games that I want to check those things off, not necessarily get the platinum or the, the uh, 100%, but when I know I want to do these side quests to make sure I get every little morsel of story and character out, you... You find yourself hesitating to do main story quests because you're like, okay, well, if I do this, am I going to get gated out of completing the side quest? Or is there going to be some uh, change of the world state where maybe I can't access these quests for a little while? And in Spider-Man 2, that can happen, right? I mean, at the very end of the game, they do tell you, hey, like most games do this. They're like, hey, this, this is the final mission before you go into this. Make sure if you want to upgrade all your stuff, you do. 
if you want to up, like, you know, you know, whatever you got to do, go do it now. And, but, you know, there are, there are other missions where that isn't the case. And where the, the setting of New York ends up by the end of the game, when the stakes are at their highest, it just feels weird to be doing, like, quaint side quests. And I, I almost wonder if there was a better way to not force you to do these side quests so it felt more paced out properly, right? To to make it so, okay, before you do this next big story mission, you need, you you are highly recommended to go do this side quest or this side quest. I don't know. It, it just, the pacing of it felt weird. And the, because they, they try to, they cram in the, you know, that, that, you know, Spider-Man's got to get the Venom suit and then he's going to lose it and then we got to do Venom. It, it felt, it, all of it felt pretty rushed to me. And, and again, that might've been how I played it, right? Maybe you at home played it a different way and, and had a different experience. But in my playthrough, it felt, it felt, it felt rushed, honestly. And I felt like there wasn't enough time for these characters to really breathe with these situations. Um, it's tough to talk about it without spoiling, but I, I don't know. So much of it is in the trailers. So, okay, real quick, spoilers here if you have not played Spider-Man 2 and don't want spoilers. But again, is it really spoilers? Harry Osborn is back in this game, right? We got the tease in Spider-Man 1's post credit scene that he's in a tube with the Venom suit. He's back, okay? So, and it's the same problem that they have in the movies, the Spider-Man movies, when they introduce Harry, except for the Raimi trilogy because he's in there from the beginning. Specifically in the Amazing Spider-Man trilogy where Harry just shows up and it's like, okay, we got to sell that these people are friends. These people being Harry, uh, Mary Jane, and Peter Parker. And I know that there are, you get a lot of that in the first game, but Harry's not actually there. It's like a dis, it's like you, you find his recordings through the Mary Jane missions and you, you end up figuring out what happened to him and the whole mystery there. But like he's, the character of Harry Osborn is not actually there. And he is in this game, and they there's a part in the beginning of the game where when Harry's back, Harry and Peter go for a bike ride, and, and like a Cage the Elephant song plays. And I don't know, man. It was really weird. It was really weird. And maybe that's the point, because you can probably guess that eventually the other shoe is going to drop with this, right? That That Harry is going to... You know, not everything is as it seems. But that's when I talk about the pacing of this. It's like, okay, let's let's really, like, inundate you with how close these guys are right off the bat. And then it kind of just stagnates for a while. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's the same problem that those Amazing Spider-Man movies have where you're like, why does Peter care so much about this guy? That being said, they do a way better job of it in the game than they do in that Amazing Spider-Man 2 movie. Um, you get a lot of flashbacks with Par- uh, Harry and Peter that works in stuff in the first game, too. And, you know, Peter Parker's a nice guy, so he's going to want to save his friend. But, uh, and then and then everything with the Venom suit, it's just, it's a problem of, of escalation and of pacing, I think. Uh, it's still, you know, it's still a great game. It looks fantastic, too. I didn't even talk about that. The graphics are remarkable. Uh, especially with the the full might of the PS5. We're not doing any of that, that remaster upgrade stuff anymore, okay? This is fully with the weight of the PS5 behind it, and it looks incredible. I'm still not crazy about the Peter Parker face redesign thing. I still think he looks weird, and I much prefer the old version, but, you know, I don't make these games, okay? They said they said that the reason they changed it was to make it easier to model. I, I believe him, right? Like... I don't know how that stuff works. He still looks weird, though. His neck is way too big. Anyway, uh, I would still recommend Spider-Man 2. I should be ranking these in what I think is going to win Game of the Year, but I'm not going to bother because there's one that's really obvious that I think is going to win. And we'll get to that shortly, but not yet. All right, so next up we've got Alan Wake 2. This, of course, coming from Remedy Entertainment, the makers of Control, uh, the makers of... What was the name of that game with the with the TV in it? There was like a whole episode of TV. Hang on. I'm going to look it up. See, this is the benefit of hosting by yourself, right? You can take 
long pauses to look stuff up. And you don't have to fill for airtime, right? Uh, you can just take as much time as Quantum Break. I found it, everybody. It's Quantum Break. Everybody remember that game? That game was okay. But Control is like the big one that I know them from. Like, I played Max Payne 3, but I don't think that was them. I think that was Rockstar. I tried playing the Alan Wake remaster of the first game, and I wasn't into it. First off, big disclaimer for this show going forward. I don't really get down with spooky games, right? Spooky things in general. Spooky games, spooky movies, spooky TV shows. I try to avoid them. Um, I'm a coward when it comes to a lot of these things. And I don't like to be scared. That being said, uh, due to that, I have not played Alan Wake 2. So what am I going to talk about? Well, uh, I've seen other people play Alan Wake 2. And it looks pretty cool. It looks uh, pretty innovative for the medium of video games. It's combining a lot of real footage with gameplay. Uh, another graphically impressive game. You know, we talked about the graphics in Spider-Man 2. The graphics in Animal Make 2 look incredible. Uh, it, it's really that blending of, of the real footage with the game that I think is really impressive. Uh, it's one that I probably will give a shot whenever it goes on sale. But... You know, I, if I'm going to play a spooky game, I don't want to pay full price to be scared. Okay, that's that's really what it comes down to. I do like uh, the aspects of how they're connecting it to um, Control. I think that's cool. Uh, I didn't play the DLC for Control, but I did finish that game. So credits did, credits were rolled on that one, but we didn't start the show yet, so it doesn't count. I, I did like Control. The story kind of lost me eventually because I have a short attention span. But the, you know, who doesn't love a good cinematic universe? And they, from what I've heard, they really doubled down on that with Animal Wake 2. And I'm sure there'll probably will be DLC for it, because they did DLC for Control. And hey, maybe at the Game Awards tonight, we'll get an announcement for DLC. So if you're listening to this post-Game Awards, which you definitely will be, because there's no way I'm posting it today, you know, hedge your bets. Maybe I'm right. Uh, we're going to skip this next one because I want to save it for the end because it's my clear favorite. So if you're keeping score at home, by the end, you'll be able to tell what it is. Uh, but next up, we've got Resident Evil 4 from Capcom. Uh, I did roll credits on this game. I did. I did. I didn't play the DLC for it yet. And I did not try the Mercenaries mode. But I did finish it. Uh, it's great. I thought this game was fantastic. I've never played the original Resident Evil, so I can't really compare it to that. Uh, but I've really been enjoying all these Resident Evil remakes. Now, again, we run into that spooky game territory where I'm a coward and don't want to play these games. The scariest one was uh, RE2 remake, and that was tough. That was, I'll be honest, that was a tough one to get through. That was a lights are on, right, volume is down, and we're just we're going to put our head down and we're going to get through it. And I did it. You know, does that make me a hero? Maybe. Maybe not. I was proud of myself. You know, maybe I didn't ha- I didn't necessarily hear all the dialogue. But, hey, beat the game. Uh, Resident Evil 4 is scary in its own right. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not, you know, it's more of like an action movie, right? Like, there are still scary parts. There's some parts where you play as uh, Sherry is the lady's name in that game, I think. Uh, and those parts are scary because you're getting chased by monsters and you don't have like a thousand guns like Leon does. Uh, but yes, Resident Evil is awesome. Like that's just the the best way I can describe it. It is awesome. Leon is so cool. And if you just like blowing different, all kinds of different enemies, the enemy variety in the game is fantastic. Uh, the feel of combat, it feels simultaneously real and arcadey. Like, the guns, before they're upgraded to make them easier to use, are all very weighty, right? They feel like, you know, when you initially fire that pistol in the beginning, it's like, okay, like, this this feels like it's got the weight of firing a real gun. I know that sounds stupid, but trust me. And as you unlock more weapons in the game, it's like, you you feel yourself getting stronger. And one of the cool things about it, and I think they did this in... All the other remakes as well, and it's probably like a OG Resident Evil thing where it's like you don't necessarily have enough ammo for one weapon to get through this encounter, but you've got enough ammo with, with all your 
arsenal combined that it encourages you to diversify what you're doing. It's kind of like Doom, which is a weird comparison. But, like, if you play Doom or Doom Eternal, that game forces you to use other weapons because it doesn't necessarily give you ammo for your favorite gun. Even Uncharted, right, or Halo, right? These games, they encourage you to use all the weapons that the game has to offer because of just what they provide you. Uh, and Resident Evil 4 definitely does that. But it's cool because then you feel like even more of like an 80s action hero as Leon. Because you're switching between, you know, pistols and shotguns and SMGs and ARs. And I mean, you can get a rocket launcher. That's pretty cool. Uh, and you have a knife. The knife is like the coolest weapon in the game because you can parry with it. And the parry is easier than Breath of the Wild. So, or not Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom. So, take that, Nintendo. But yeah, that's Resident Evil 4. Um, the story is also cool. I feel like I didn't mention the story. A lot of cool villains. Leon, like I said, is the coolest character ever. I'm definitely more of a Leon fan than a Chris fan. Again, having no horse in this race because I've only ever played the remakes. I played RE6 recently, the original. So, you know, work from the back. I'm really hoping we get that RE6 remake too. Uh, but moving on, uh, we've got Super Mario Wonder. Now, I do own this game, but I have not played it yet because I lent it to my girlfriend. So I've only seen other people play it. It's another one of those. Uh, I hope to play it one day because, I, you know, I love a good Mario game. And actually, in the lead-up to the Game Awards, I have... Um, I've been playing a lot of the Mario games that I've just bought and never finished or even started, like uh, Bowser's Fury, uh, Super Mario through what's the what's the one New Super Mario Brothers, whatever one's on the Switch. Well, they're <laughs> they're all on the Switch, but I think you know the one I'm talking about. It was like the one that was on DS that then got it's got ported like five times. That one, and I really enjoy uh, Bowser's Fury. What I've Bowser's Fury, what I've played of that so far. Uh, it's just, it reminds me a little bit of Galaxy. I play, I loved Galaxy 1 and 2 when I was a kid, and it's kind of those vibes. Um, but, you know, it's not nominated for Game of the Year. Super Mario Wonder is, and I'm just stalling because I really don't have much to say about it. Uh, it looks unique. It's got a cool art style. You can be an elephant. Uh, I'm into that. Not in, like, a weird way. I just, you know, never seen Mario as an elephant before. Uh, I don't think it's going to win. Oh, Resident Evil 4, I also don't think it's going to win. But I think it's got a pretty good, you know... It's up there. I'm sure it'll win other categories. Uh, Super Mario Wonder, I think, is probably the lowest on the uh, tier list here for what we think or what I think could win. Uh, I'm not really sure why it's on there. It's the one. It's the one nomination that I would probably take out to sub in for something else. Uh, there were a lot of snubs this year, like uh, Armored Core Six. Final Fantasy 16, that's probably the biggest one that people are mad about. I'm not a big Final Fantasy guy, but I could definitely see people being like, where's FF16? Armored Core 6, like I said, that's another game. Armored Core 6 might be like the number one no credits rolled game because I'm just so bad at FromSoft games. It's it's embarrassing, and I'm sure we'll get to it on another episode. Uh, personally, I would have had Sea of Stars in there just because I love that game and I will probably talk about it a lot because guess what? I haven't finished it. I have not finished it, but I highly recommend it. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, that's Super Mario Wonder. And last but not least, we've got our last, our very last domination is Baldur's Gate 3, ladies and gentlemen. And I will guarantee you that Baldur's Gate 3 will win your 2023 Game of the Year award. I just don't see it going to any other game. That's just a fact. I mean, from Larian Studios, they made Divinity 2 Original Sin, another fantastic game that I was telling everybody to play that I never finished. But that, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 is the realization of, of all the dreams you could ever want, okay? Especially if you like D&D. If you like D&D, you should immediately go out and buy this game because it is... In some ways, I think it's better than actually playing D&D, like on a tabletop role-playing sense. It incorporates the systems of D&D so much, so well, and incorporates some of the systems better than the actual tabletop game does, right? I, the, and I talked about this when I was on Insights into Entertainment um, with my dad. 
go like and subscribe. Insights into entertainment. Insights into things is the podcast network. But what we talked about was the the story and the way in that game that NPCs and and other characters just remember everything and how your little actions can have the biggest ramifications and how in so many situations you can go about it in pretty much any way you want. And, like, game developers say that, right, or marketing will say that, but, like, it's true in Baldur's Gate 3. You're able to incorporate aspects of your character's backstory from the very beginning of the game, uh, certain abilities that you acquire along the way, certain, depending on what companions you have with you at any given moment, can can totally change how the story goes. And I'm still in my initial playthrough because this game, like, will take you 5,000 hours to beat. But uh, my dad, who's been exclusively playing it since it came out on console, he's done multiple playthroughs, and he said every playthrough is unique. And there's just really no other game like that. And it's it's almost, it's so great that it's tough to put in the words without, you know, just off the cuff here. Uh, it's up for eight nominations, I think. Baldur's Gate. Uh, there's a couple I don't think it'll win. Like, I don't think it's going to win multiplayer category. I think it's just nominated for that just to, just to give it another, <laughs> just to give it another nomination. Um, I do think it will win game of the year. I think for what it does for gaming, I think it set the bar so high going forward for what a, a narrative RPG can be that I don't think, you know, I think this will be a landmark going forward for a very long time, you know, people look back at, you know, the the original Fallout games or like, uh, I don't know what to compare it to. I didn't play those old computer PC RPGs, but you know what I mean? Like those games that we still compare things to today. Witcher 3 is one that comes to mind. These like landmark RPGs that define the genre and that you can go back to, you know, five, ten years later and they still hold up and you're still getting new moments out of I think Baldur's Gate 3 is a shoe in for Game of the Year. I don't see how it could go to anything else. Not that I'll be, like, you know, in the street picketing if it does. I just, I don't see how it could go to anything else. Uh, so, and as we perhaps go through the other things here, I will, uh, my bias will probably show because I just love the game so much. Uh, except for a couple categories where I've got other biases. But anyway, that's your Game of the Year uh, nominations uh, tell me what you would like to see win, or maybe don't, because when this comes out, the Game Awards will have already happened. So just think about it right now. Just think about it in your mind what you think you'd want to win. Anyway, my name's Sam Whale, and you're listening to the No Credits Rolled Podcast. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to get, going to get back into the Game Awards <laughs> Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. All right, everybody, we're back on No Credits Rolled, talking Game Awards. Uh, we talked about the Game of the War, Game of the Year nominations, and we're going to cover some of the smaller categories very quickly. We have got uh, Best Performance. Ben Starr in Final Fantasy 16 didn't play it. Sure, he's a nice guy. Cameron Monaghan in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. He did okay. I didn't really like that game. Uh, I was kind of bummed out by that game, to be honest. Uh, it was, I don't know, maybe I got to play it again. 
I was playing on console and it ran real bad. So I don't know if maybe um, maybe that took away from it. I just wasn't into it. Uh, what else we got? Idris Elba and Cyberpunk 2077. Phantom Liberty, which is an expansion for Cyberpunk. And it's also Idris Elba, who's like a real actor. Um, so that's something. I mean, <laughs> I think it'd be funny if he won. He can put it next to like his Oscars. Has Idris Elba won any Oscars? Let's look that up. Idris Elba Oscars. He got a BAFTA. Emmy. Golden Globe. All right, he hasn't won an Oscar. He's got a bunch of other stuff, though. So he can put it next to that. Uh, Melanie LeBird from Alan Wake 2. I believe she plays the other main character in that game that isn't named Alan Wake. Again, haven't played that game. I'm sure she did a fantastic job. Uh, Neil Newbon from Baldur's Gate 3. Here's the category where I show my not Baldur's Gate 3 bias. uh, Because Neil Newbon plays Asterion. And in my playthrough, I killed Asterion pretty much right away. So Asterion is not in my uh, Baldur's Gate 3 narrative, right? He's not part of my story with that game, Uh, which is probably unfortunate because he seems to be the standout character for most people in the game. And I killed him immediately. So, oops. Uh, And finally, Yuri Lowenthal uh, as Peter Parker in Marvel Spider-Man 2. This is my clear bias here because I think Yuri is the best. He's Sasuke Uchiha in the Naruto English dub. He's Spider-Man most of the time when he's animated. Like he, he he's like one of the more known voices for voicing Spider-Man. Uh, I think he's fantastic, and I hope he wins it. I don't know if he will, but that'd be great if he did. He also seems like a fun guy. You know, if you see clips of him, he seems like he gets it. He seems like... You know, he seems like a a nice guy, okay? I hope he is. I hope he's a nice guy. I'd love to talk to him one day. So that is uh, best performance. Uh, I have a section on here about the indie discussion with Day of the Diver and everything. I don't really want to get into that, folks. I'll be honest. You can look it up. Uh, You know, of course, Dave, I'll give you a quick summary here. I don't want to tease you. But Day of the Diver, of course, uh, owned by Nexon, which is in the pocket of like a billion-dollar company, so it's like, are they really an indie game? No, they're not. But I think the way we use the word indie, uh, I think just going forward, we just need to change the categories, right? Like maybe do like small studio or something. Uh, I don't know. It would be up to Jeff Keeley. I just think the way that we colloquially, we, oh geez, colloquially, there we go, use the term indie game, um, we th- we think of a Dave the Diver because it's got pixel graphics and it looks, you know, it's not a AAA f- first person Call of Duty shooter, um, but it's not independent. It's just not, and it'd be wild if it won. That being said, Dave the Diver is awesome. Uh, Dave the Diver is a great game, and I highly recommend you play it. But you look at the other games in this category, like Sea of Stars, which I've already shown my bias for. They are independent owned by um, a company that I can't remember the name of, but the company that did The Messenger. Oh, man, this game's so great, people. There's a there's a free demo you can go play. You should go play it. Sabotage. Yes. This is from the press kit uh, from the studio. Continuing on the sabotage journey of developing games that blend retro aesthetics and modern game design, invigorated and motivated by The Messenger's overwhelmingly positive response, it was time for the real big challenge. Uh, and they nailed it, guys. Right? I mean, I, sea of the star, Sea of Stars, I think deserved a Game of the Year nomination. Uh, it really, really resonated with me. And again, <laughs> this is all with the caveat that I haven't finished it. So, who am I to say, really? But that's the name of the show, right? No credits rolled. I, I, I'm phrasing this as if it's like some kind of protest. Like I'm not finishing games as to make a statement. But I'm not finishing games because I have a terrible attention span and I I can't focus on anything. So <laughs> I think that's the bigger problem. Uh, but go play Sea of Stars. It's great. What else we got here? I think that was those are the categories I really wanted to highlight. I'm sure there's others that will that people will have debates about. But like I don't know. There was one that was like influencer of the year or something like that. 
creator of the year might have been it. I don't know who I didn't know who any of those people were, so I sound like an old man. I'm just not gonna touch on those. Uh but let's transition over to uh the other side of the show, the no credits rolled section, the namesake of the show. Maybe I should have led with that. You know, maybe that's why this is a pilot. Maybe that's why we're getting our feel for this show. Maybe I should have led with the name of the, the namesake of the show. But the news is more pertinent. So I don't know. Maybe we'll change the format going forward. Anyway, I've got three games written here that I just quickly jotted down before I started recording uh, that I want to talk about that are games that, now that I'm looking at it, arguably three of these couldn't be finished even if I wanted to. So that's my bad, but it's, we're, we're going to go with it. This is this is live showbiz. So game number one I've got here that I have been playing uh, off and on is a game called Party Animals. This is a multiplayer uh, battle royale kind of. If you've ever played Fall Guys, it's a little bit like that. Elements of Fall Guys, elements of Gang Beast, if you've played that. That kind of ragdoll, um, ragdoll physics. Uh, I mostly just put it on here because I think it's really funny. It's a game that's made me laugh out loud a lot just because of the way the physics in the game work. In the game works. And the character models that you can pick from. Uh, it's called Party Animals because you are playing as these little animals. And they all just look so stupid. <laughs> but in like the, the best way possible. Uh, it is on Game Pass. Actually, all these games that I'm going to talk about today are part of Games Pass. And I'm not sponsored by Games Pass, but I do think it's an incredible value, especially if you're someone like me that likes to play. There are benefits to this no credits rolled aspect of me that, you know, that I never finish games. I like to play all different kinds of games. And if a game comes to Games Pass, even if it's a game that I don't even think I would enjoy or that I've never heard of or it's in a genre that I usually don't play, I'll I'll download it and I'll boot it up. And I think that's, it's, it'd be like if the library like mailed you books and we're like, just read this. Just trust us. Just read it. That's kind of like Games Pass for someone like me that likes to try all different kinds of games. But yeah, Party Animals, especially if you can play it with friends, I don't because I don't have any friends on Xbox. All my friends are on PlayStation. Uh, I can imagine it would be even more fun because you could be like a cute little otter and knock your friend who is a cute little gorilla and kick him like off a train or something. I don't know. You could look up gameplay, and that'll probably make you laugh, too. I highly recommend it. Anyway, moving on to game number two is uh, Halo's back, everybody. Halo Infinite multiplayer, the latest season, and I think they're doing, like, a limited event now. Halo is so back, they added some new items, um, some new guns, and it's just... I've always been a big Halo fan. Halo might have been, like, the first game I ever played as a kid, like, Halo 1 and 2 and 3 and all that. Like, that was the first series for me that I really connected with. I read a bunch of the books. Like, I was deep. I was deep in the Halo lore, especially leading up to the release of Halo 4. Because, like, by the time Halo 3 came around, like, I was... I was into gaming enough to be like, okay, I, I'm i not just playing this because it's on my dad's Xbox. Like, I am actively invested in this, and I love these these games. So when Halo Infinite came out, I was stoked because it was, it looked like, at the time, a return to form. And in some ways it was. Uh, the environment sure was. It was a big green forest, and that was pretty much it. But the biggest thing, you know, you, you say what you will about Halo Infinite. It's got its problems. It, it had its, its problems. Had, H-A-D, its problems with the multiplayer. But the gameplay was what they really nailed. They nailed the gameplay in both the campaign and the multiplayer. And it, that's what made it feel like Halo was back when it dropped. Um, it also helped that the multiplayer dropped day and date. And that, like, blew everybody's minds. But the gameplay is what really stuck out. And I would still, even... You know, at least a couple times a month, I would pop on, since release, I would pop on Halo Infinite multiplayer, and I would do a couple rounds just because I love the gameplay of Halo. And now with this new season, it really seems like they're giving it another push to be like, okay, guys, we are really giving it 
are all again. We're putting effort into this. We want people to come back to this game. And I think they're succeeding. I think it had its like highest player count in like a very long time. And that's when games like Fortnite and Apex are still dominating. Halo is able to still have a name for itself. And if I remember correctly, I think the multiplayer for Halo was free, or at least it was. And that's awesome. That's, again, in a world with your Apex and your Fortnites that are dominating this landscape. Now, will that Halo Battle Royale ever come out? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, doubt it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I feel like that ship has sailed, right? Like, I, I don't think the Battle Royale craze is still around like it used to be. I think a lot of that died with, like, Battlefield Firestorm. Anybody remember that from Battlefield Five? I don't know. It seems crazy because Halo seems like a perfect environment for that. Thing. I think there were, weren't there, like, data mine leaks of them finding, like, voice assets for the Battle Royale? So, I don't know. Maybe it'll still come down the line. But, uh... Only time will tell. So, yeah, number two on my list of no credits rolled here. Again, another thing that I probably couldn't roll credits on even if I wanted to. Uh, the Halo Infinite multiplayer. I highly recommend you check it out. They just, as of recording, just added a King of the Hill PvE mode where you're fighting Covenant and aliens and brutes and all them with other players. So it's kind of like a new mode, kind of, but not really. Uh, anyway, uh, number three on this list is Remnant 2 from the Ashes. Now, I tried playing Remnant 1 uh, a couple of times. And it's kind of like a Dark Souls shooter thing. Um, I wasn't a big fan of Remnant 1. I I felt that it was kind of obtuse, and honestly, the gameplay was not very fun. But I heard a lot of great things about Remnant 2. And, and the only reason I played it was because it came to Games Pass. I was on the fence about buying it because I really wanted to play it. Uh, I didn't, though, because it was full price and I didn't want to spend that kind of money. But then it came to Games Pass, so I was like, all right, let me give it a shot. And it's really fun. I th it's still pretty similar to the first one, but maybe I was doing it wrong in the first one. I didn't do any research for this, so I'm sh maybe the Remnant fans out there are, like, you know, screaming again at me, but... I think the in the second one they it reminds me of Returnal if you've ever played that on PS5 where it's like you're exploring this like alien world. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of that because at least in the beginning it is an open world environment the stage that I'm at. But I just think the gunplay feels a lot better. It almost reminds me of Gears of War a little bit too because it is a third person shooter. There's no cover. There, you, you you can't take cover. But, you know, shooting hordes of enemies, dodging, rolling, meleeing when they get close. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Gears of War. And I love those games, too. Uh, not so much in recent years, but it reminds me of the good old days of that. And I like the aesthetic of Remnant, too. It's, like, very, like, dark and kind of gross. And, and there's, it feels like there's elements of, like, Eldritch Horror to it, which I'm always a fan of. Uh, but I do think it's... There's probably a story campaign that I could roll credits on, but I think it's like a Destiny situation where the game keeps going even when you beat that. So uh, that's number three on my list of no credits rolled. I want to know what you're playing out there, right? Do you, you know, the, the whole idea for this podcast was I, I've been wanting to do a podcast for a while. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do it on. I knew I wanted to do it something gaming related because at the end of the day, I think that's the only thing that I could talk about for an hour. And, right? I mean, nothing else really interests me that much to where I could just spout my own opinions for an hour on it. Uh, so I decided to do this, and uh, my dad helped me out a lot with it, so I appreciate that. Uh, he helped me come up with a title and a concept. Uh, we were kind of just sitting around the kitchen table just kind of brainstorming ideas, and we came up with this. So, you know, my goal with this show is to cover gaming news stories that I, if I want, that I find interesting um, and then I also want to talk about games that I'm playing because I'm always playing like, you know, eight games at once and I'm never finishing any of them. Uh, and I want to, I want to know if that if I'm the only one that does stuff like that, especially with services like games pass and the PlayStation collection. I feel like I'm, you know, every other day I'm starting a new game when I, I know in my heart that I've still got like 10 more I got to finish. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, I know I didn't get to a full hour. But this is kind of just a pilot run to see the flow of the show to get my footing uh, and to see if I want this is something I really want to pursue. And I, I definitely think it will be. 
Uh, so if you're tuned in right now, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you next time on No Credits Roll. Thank you.